Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. John Santa Anna. Hi, everyone. Tom Navity, Dr. Navity. So, uh, so our topic for tonight is uh, painful diabetic neuropathy and treatments for for here at the Michigan Center for Regenerative Medicine. Okay. So we are uh, Michigan Center for Regenerative Medicine. Um, however, we offer full spectrum of treatments, and uh, uh, one of the things that um, oftentimes our patients come in with is neuropathic pain or nerve pain. Um, our topic is diabetic peripheral neuropathy which is the most common reason people come to us with neuropathy uh, or nerve-related pains, but it's not the only reason. Right. Um, so while we'll talk about diabetic neuropathy, uh, just know that that does apply to many other types of neuropathy. So even if your neuropathy isn't diabetic, what we're going to talk about tonight is likely um, ac applicable for you. Yep. So what, So when, when people say they have neuropathy, or what, what exactly is neuropathy, and particularly what exactly is that painful diabetic neuropathy? Yeah, so the neuropathy means you have uh, something wrong with your nerves. Um, and peripheral neuropathy means you have something wrong with your nerves that are outside of your spinal cord and outside of your brain. So the nerves in your legs and your hands most commonly presents with numbness. Mm -hmm. um, can't feel things. Uh, patients say it feels like I'm stepping on rocks um, or, uh, or kind of a hard surface. They just don't feel the bottoms of their feet. Right. Typically before they have problems with their hands. Um, and the reason is it's a length dependent problem of the nerve. Um, nerves are really funny. Uh, in that their cell bodies are clear up in our spinal cord region, um, and then the, that same single cell goes all the way to the tips of our feet and the tips of our fingers. Yep, yep. And then and that, what I can have you said is right. So typically the nerves transmit these abnormal sig signals. Most commonly it can be numbness or tingling and stuff like that. But in the worst case, you can have issues such as burning. Um, so it seems like your feet are on fire. Or, or even worse, like sharp pains, or like stabbing razor sharp pains in the feet when you're standing or walking. So very, very difficult. It could be a really painful problem. It can disrupt sleep. It disrupts people's able to walk, take care of themselves, exercise. Right. It really affects every aspect of a patient's lives. And when it's real bad, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a tough one to deal with. Yeah, and, and the sad part about diabetic neuropathy is that no one really knows what the etiology is. They know that people who have diabetes you know, the first time to control the diabetes, but sometimes when it's out of control or you've had diabetes for a long time, you can develop painful diabetic neuropathy. So because of the etiology is still kind of unknown, there's some theories with, you know, um, that goes on there, but nothing's been completely proven. And I think that's one of the difficulties with treating something when we don't know exactly what causes it in the first place. It, it kind of makes it difficult to treat. So. Uh, treatments for diabetic neuropathy, you know, we have a few that we've tried. It's primarily just to address the symptoms, again, because you don't know exactly what causes it. Um, the most common uh, things that you would probably use for are our medications. Mm -hmm. right? Yep. So um, commonly seizure medicines, uh, neuropathic pain medicines are, are the first line of treatments, um, which are pills that are designed and studied to slow channels in your, in your neurons in your brain. Um, when those uh, neurons are firing over and over and over again, it can make you have a seizure. Um, that same mechanism of action with these calcium channels and sodium channels that are opening and closing um, that cause you to have a seizure, it's the same mechanism of action that your nerves outside the spinal cord and outside the brain, so the peripheral nerves, um, opening and closing, firing pain signals all the time. Yeah. Uh, these same types of medicines slow those nerves' ability to do that and so it helps reduce that signal of pain shooting up to your brain. Yeah, so the downside of that is like, so it works really well, but the downside to that is it does make some people feel tired and sluggish and sleepy. So, you know, having a full-time job or even having to take care of kids or making have to make decisions throughout, it's kind of hard because if you are dragging throughout the day or you feel tired or you have this cloudy haze over you, it's, uh, it's hard to function throughout the day with that. Yeah. So I, yeah. I had that conversation today with a patient. Yeah. Oh, so, wow. Uh, he yeah. was uh, uh, in sales, and he was having a tough time you know, getting through a sales pitch, remembering his, he was having train of thought issues, and it was really affecting his job. The medicines were fortunately controlling his, his pain, um, but it was the cognitive side effects were really affecting his job. So we discussed some of the other options that are out there. Yeah. So the other ones, too, is that you can try you know, anti antidepressants, right? So you... Um, these kind of have their own side effect profile as well. Sometimes it can make you also sleepy and tired and kind of sluggish, again, with the haze. Um, but there are other topical treatments that we would do too, uh, things like capsaicin or some lidocaine creams. But 
a lot of times we actually do a combination of these medications because you know it depends on your tolerance and how severe your symptoms are you may need a combination of different things which may help with your symptoms or it may not so in, that's why we have other treatments outside of just the pharmacological things that we would offer so I still pay with uh, with the creams you know we're taking those same pills essentially and crushing them up and putting in a uh, cream that penetrates your skin so rather than taking a pill that goes to your stomach and from your stomach it goes everywhere right your body can't choose just to send it to your feet for example or just to your fingertips um, it's gonna send it everywhere including your brain which is what gives those side effects whereas you put those pills into a cream and then if you just want the cream or the medicine to go to your foot you just rub the cream on your foot right um, this getting medicine through the skin is a little bit tricky the type of uh, cream we want to use has some sort of a base that penetrates the skin well but um, when it when it's enough of the drug in the area it's an extremely effective way to control pain in a specific area without having collateral damage to the side effects yeah yeah but there's still some side effects there too right you can develop some rashes and it still has to be excreted by your body so you know your liver and your kidneys still have to work to to be able to kind of clear the yeah take your shoes stuff. off you got to take your socks off you got to put a cream on your feet yeah. it, it, it's not a cure-all by any means but it is a, a, a simpler option. another option right. um, that we try to walk patients through again one of the things we pride ourselves is is really laying out all the options for our patients and helping them um, choose the best one that's going to work for their lifestyle yeah yeah so outside of medications you know that's one of the other aspect that we type, like to focus on because a lot of times the patients that we see here in the office They've already seen their primary care. They're, they already probably are following with their podiatrist and they're trying all these other medications, but they still have this breakthrough pain or, or they're not able to tolerate the side effects from the medications. And I think that's where we come in and what we specialize in is all these other non-pharmacological treatments that are more invasive, but it really does address the issue. Yeah, we've got some nice props here on the side. There's a couple companies uh, that, that have uh, given us some of their pamphlets and some of their other um, uh, uh, explanatory uh, uh, props so that when we're discussing these options with patients we have um, pictures or we have actual um, items they can hold in their hands and, and deal with but um, spinal cord stimulators and peripheral nerve stimulators right. are two of the things that, that we specialize in um, when patients have really tried most of the standard therapies and either the side effects are too great or the benefits just not enough um, and they need something more yeah um, and these are all invasive options so we try the non-invasive stuff first uh, but when necessary, these uh, these are two really good tools that we can offer patients. Yeah, so we call them invasive because they involve injections. Uh, the nice thing about them is they're they're minimally invasive. Right? Everything's done through a needle. Uh, we do it here in the office. It's an outpatient procedure here in the office. It takes us, you know, maybe you know half an hour to about an hour to do. The idea is uh, starting with uh, peripheral nerve stimulation. Is you have these nerves that give sensation to the feet for diabetic painful neuropathy. The idea is you're putting this device, essentially it's a very thin piece of wire, alongside that nerve where we are able to control how much of those electrical impulses and signals that the nerve transmits that's painful, we're able to block with this device. So the nice thing about the, per the peripheral stimulator is that it's very discreet. It kind of just goes into and close to the area that we want to treat. So kind of like in the, in the ankle shin area of your lower leg. Um, and it's, uh, we do a trial of it first. So with the trial, we insert the device here in the office with a simple outpatient procedure. You go home um, and take it for a test drive for about five days, and then you see how well it works. After five days, we take it out, and if only if it's effective in relieving your pain and getting you back into function is when we'll schedule you for a permanent implant. That's when we go in there and actually embed the whole device under your skin and anchor it with, uh, with sutures. And, and this kind of maintains it there and you get to control it pretty much forever uh, and, and really gives you really good results and, and relief. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that it's, it's a trial first. So you really truly get a, a sense of how well this is gonna work for you or not before you commit to having one permanently implanted under your skin. Um, and while it's a surgical procedure, it's a very minimally invasive surgical procedure, all done through needles mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, uh, and not all patients, in fact, I encourage most patients to do them without sedation. Um, doesn't even require uh, going under. Local anesthetic is, is more than enough to cover the, the discomfort associated with uh, placing these devices. Yep, yeah. Um, well, next up is uh, the spinal cord stimulator. Yeah, so, so if, if you have um, 
painful diabetic neuropathy typically affects both legs. Um, so uh, uh, other conditions sometimes only affect one leg. And if it's really just one leg, the peripheral nerve stem is, in my opinion, definitely the way to go. Yep. Um, if it's affecting both legs, well, then you need one on your right and you need one on your left. So maybe rather than putting one on both sides, maybe that patient would be better served by putting uh, leads in the epidural space, which is in your spine, uh, where these nerves can join on their way up to your brain. So um, the way I try to explain it, it's kind of like that pain signal is driving up small dirt roads that become freeways that become super freeways and we can block that signal anywhere along its train along its trip to your brain um, and the, the place where all of those roads come together is in the area of your spine called the dorsal column so the other term for a spinal cord stimulator is a dorsal column stimulator and instead of putting the leads next to those tiny nerves in your legs we put them on the top of your spinal canal in the area called the dorsal column um, and those leads then shut the nerves down at that level. Yeah, and it's because it's in your spinal cord or close to the spinal cord, you're able to control a, a wide range of symptoms in a, a wide range area. So you could, you could block all the way like a dime-sized spot on, on your foot or your entire ankle or your entire leg or both legs. So it really gives you that nice variability. Um, one of the reasons why I like spinal cord stimulator too is because if you have not just foot pain, but you have like knee pain from arthritis or something like that, then we can control that as well. So it kind of gives you that extra added uh, effect um, with, with that spinal cord stimulator. And the same, same effect as we did the peripheral stimulator, we do a trial of it first. And it's only if you have a successful trial when you have significant improvements is when we'll move forward with the, the surgical implant, which is again, a, a pretty straightforward procedure. Yep. Those ones are a little bit more invasive. Those ones re do require sedation. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, um, anchoring that needs to be done under the skin and so those leads don't move. Mm -hmm. um, and then depending on what system you go with, um, most of them have a battery pack, uh, very similar to like a pacemaker type battery. So if you know if anybody has a pacemaker, it's a very similar type procedure yeah. uh, to pacemakers like where a battery pack gets in, inserted under your skin. Um, that battery can be recharged through the skin, uh, very much like you put a, a cell phone on a, on a charger and you don't necessarily yeah plug in a uh, similar technology for recharging these batteries um, and now they even have ones that uh, the battery is external and, and communicates through the skin um, so that you don't have to have the battery inserted pros and cons to both that, yep. uh, depending on, on the patients and clothing wearing and, and other um, things that we want to bring into consideration uh, for ease of use um, it just you know it, it's there's multiple choices for everybody to find the best possible solution that uh, gives you the least kind of uh, uh, inconvenience to your lifestyle. Yep. yep. So just to kind of circle back on, on you know, consult, consults here in the office too. So one of the things that we like to do as well is when we come into the office complaining of diabetic neuropathy or neuropathy in general, we, we actually do our own evaluation as well. So one of the things, one of the tools that we use to evaluate your neuropathy or your painful diabetic neuropathy is doing an EMG or, or a nerve test. So a lot of times, the presentation of neuropathy can be related to multiple things. So one of them is from diabetes. The other ones are could be from a pinched nerve in your knee or your ankle or anywhere along those lines. It could be related to what people call sciatica also when it's coming from, you know, an impingement in the sciatic nerve. And even all the way up into, let's say, a herniated disc in your lower back can mimic the same presentation that, that presents as diabetic neuropathy or painful neuropathy too. So. One of the best tools that we have to differentiate that and, and to pick that out is to, to do an EMG or a nerve test. That way we're able to see how well your nerves conduct signals and also we get to see how well your muscles respond to those nerve signals too. Um, it's, it's one more thing to use if you've been diagnosed with a neuropathy and you're trying all these other treatments but it seems like it's not as effective as they should be then maybe one of the reasons why is because it's it's coming from a different source or a different insult. Um, the other good thing about EMGs besides confirming the diagnosis is giving us a baseline. Um, it's one of those tests that has numbers associated to it and those numbers can change. Uh, those numbers can get better, those numbers can get worse. Mm -hmm. And then it helps us correlate with hopefully your symptoms either getting better or in the case where they're getting worse, um, helps you maybe make that decision to be a little bit more aggressive in, in what you decide to do for treatment. Yeah. Um, there are some regenerative options um, that are emerging uh, for this type of condition. Uh, it's not something that we've implemented here yet. Um, it's something we're keeping an eye on. Um, I have a, a personal friend uh, who had 
amazing results for his diabetic neuropathy by going to a uh, regenerative clinic in Texas uh, that's using combination of lasers and, and platelet-rich plasma injections, PRP. Um, so uh, it's not something we've uh, advertised in, in extensively yet. It's not something we have a lot of experience treating as we do with spines and knees and hips and shoulders, um, our, our orthopedic indications. Uh, but it's certainly something that we'd be willing to talk to our patients about. Um, going into it with an open mind, you know, knowing that it's not something that's got the science or that has the long-term outcome data like we do with our, um, our, our orthopedic conditions. Um, it's certainly something we'd be willing to talk to patients about, if, especially if you've tried everything yep. and are really uh, looking for something that might help reverse your neuropathy um, and then avoid maybe needing an implant or some sort of a, of a longer-term solution. Yeah, the field of regenerative medicine is so new, so and there's so many advances that happen. There's new discoveries that happen, but at the same time, we have to be very careful of which you know uh, tr technologies that we adapt. We want to make sure that it's safe, which we know PRP and stem cells are safe. And also the second thing is, is it efficacious, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the other aspect that, you know, we, we want to make sure that when we present these options to our patients, we know the full gamut of, of kind of what's going to happen and what to expect with, uh, with the treatments. And, you know, uh, regenerative medicine for, for neuropathy is still one of those kind of states where I'd like to see a few more studies come out to show its efficacy. It does show promise. So it's one of these things that, like Dr. Yep. Navi said, we're keeping a close eye on. And I'm hopeful that one of these days will be something that we can add to our armamentum to present to patients with, with these neuropathy issues. Yeah, for me right now, it kind of fits in that category of uh, orthopedic conditions that are coming from some sort of genetic or some sort of autoimmune disease, um, where you know, we can repair the joint, but it's just going to damage right back really quickly if we don't also treat the problem that's causing the condition in the first place. Right. In the case of a genetic disorder, boy, that's tough. We don't have gene therapy yet. Um, in the case of an autoimmune disorder, you know, there are therapies. So I, I always encourage our patients to make sure that they're on treatment therapy for their autoimmune disease, get that stabilized, and then we look at doing some sort of regenerative treatment. So okay. my thought process is pretty similar when it comes to neuropathy. It's okay, you know, what's causing it? In the case of it's diabetes, you know, make sure we get your diabetes under control, yeah. get your sugars under control. Um, and, you know, my, my good friend who, who had that successful treatment in Texas uh, did just that. You know, he lost 60 pounds. He started exercising again, he was eating properly, he got his blood sugar, his A1C, which is the marker that we look at for um, how well your blood sugars have been controlled over a couple months. He got his A1C numbers back down to normal, but that neuropathy wasn't improving. And that's when uh, he asked me about regenerative, and I said, hey, I think it's, you know, we're trying, shot, right? Yeah. It's worth, we're trying, yeah. there's nothing that we have otherwise that can reverse uh, neuropathy. We can mask the pain with all those things that we try, but there's right. nothing that can truly reverse it. And here he is almost a year out and he hasn't come back yet. So nice. um, he seems to have had a reversal he did not have before and after EMGs. I would love to have seen him have before and after EMG testing to show that his numbers actually improved. Yeah. That would be more definitive than just right. his, his symptoms. But the most important thing is whether his symptoms went away. Yeah. Fortunately for him, the symptoms gone away. Um, the man was uh, uh, a Dr. Pepper fiend. He's given up Dr. Pepper. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and now he's, he's you know, much happier much, much more active, able to play golf with us and, and um, play all 36 holes on, oh, our, wow. on our golf outings. Yeah. So, uh, it's, uh, it's a great story. And yeah. uh, again, it's one that we're cautiously optimistic about. Um, but certainly if it's something you're interested in, we'd be happy to, to talk to you about all those options, including the regenerative ones. Yeah. Um, I think about, uh, that does it for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, we will open it up to, to questions. If you guys have questions, please type them in. Um, Happy to respond to them, and uh, if we don't get to them uh, during this uh, uh, webinar, we pre-recorded this one, so um, I'll be on the on the web uh, answering questions. But uh, if there's any any questions that come up, happy to happy to answer them. Um, if you think of them afterwards, feel free to call us, email us, however you want to contact us. Um, Michigan Center of Regenerative Medicine, two four eight two one six one zero zero eight, and uh, regenerativemedicinemichigan.com. That's it. All right. Um, Looking forward to hearing from you, and uh, have a great night. Everybody, thank you.